All right, good evening, folks. Welcome to our indoor bocce preseason coaches meeting. Uh, a lot of you have already had your coaches meetings with your district reps, but this is another opportunity for you to get some information um, and ask some questions if you have them. Again, we will record this and we will put it on the website. Um, we will also distribute this to the district reps should they want to share. Um, but we'll get going and we'll start off with uh, some information. Again, we do have our polar plunge as usual. Cool Schools is on February 1st. Uh, right now, it is still 10 to 1. Uh, depending on the growth of Cool Schools, there may be another time slot added, but that's our typical time. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to myself or Jesse Hayes. Um, uh, it's actually probably best to reach out to Allison Crosscut now. Um, she has taken over the Cool Schools, and we can get you her information as well. Additionally, if you have questions about busing to cool schools, um, we do work out with schools information about um, getting buses and assisting with busing to cool schools. You've raised this money for us. We're willing to help. Again, reach out. We can work with you guys. If you have not taken the Coaching Unified Sports training through NFHS, it's a free training. Uh, it's a very good training. It's not something you have to take. Some of our district reps do require coaches to take it, but not everybody is required. Uh, again, check out your district rep if that's something um, included, but it's a very good training, worth the time to commit to it. It's about an hour and 15, hour and a half at most. Athlete leadership will want to remind you about the other two components of Unified Champion Schools, which is whole school engagement and youth leadership. Uh, captains on your teams covers the youth leadership aspect, and we're always pushing for more and more teams to have captains. We would love you to have a unified pair as your captains for your teams. Um, this goes over kind of what captains are typically responsible. They're responsible for all the same stuff any other varsity captains are, you know, making sure the team members are on time, helping with warm ups, uh, you know, helping the coaches, whatever you set for your captains is what we're looking for. Additionally, if you want to scan this QR code or use this, use this link uh, to report who your captains are for the season, uh, our UCS department is working to, uh, you know, get more recognition out there. They'll send them what you're seeing here, uh, essentially a certificate saying that they were a captain. Uh, but again, they want to make sure they are representing and supporting your captains that are putting in the work throughout the season. Uh, again, reminders on sportsmanship. Um, be good leaders as coaches, the stronger leaders that you are, uh, the better example that you set, the stronger your team is, the better example they set for everyone as well. Um, so please do remember sportsmanship is a huge component of unified sports. Uh, Katie Turner is back as our unified bocce chair. She is not on with us tonight because she had her baby. Uh, Evan Turner uh, was born yesterday. So got the good news. He's in good shape. She's in good shape and everyone's happy. So uh, she will be out on maternity leave, but she will still be prepared to help us with Unified Bocce. Additionally, we have made a new hire to Special Olympics Maryland. Uh, he is on this call with us. Tyler Harrell is the manager for High School Unified Sports. Uh, he will be handling more of the district level stuff for Unified Sports as we roll along. Um, so as you continue to communicate with myself and Katie, uh, it's probably good to start getting in the loop, getting Tyler in the loop as well so he can support um, but he will be continuing to support us and you will see him throughout the season. And this is me. If you haven't figured out who I am over the course of a few years, um, I don't know how you got away with it, but uh, if you need my contact info, it is there. If you see that you're getting a call from a New Jersey number or a text from a New Jersey number, it is likely me. Uh, so again, if you need anything, please reach out to us and let us know. Um, but please, if you have communications about uh, things that you need for your team, work through your district rep first and your athletic directors, and then they'll reach out to us as well if they have issues. So let's talk some admin stuff. Uh, for the most part, we're going to blow through this because your uh, district reps have already covered 99.9% .9 of this. This is the season timeline that we've given the district reps for deadlines for stuff to be turned into us at the headquarters office for Special Olympics Maryland they may have different timelines. So while these dates are good for you to remember, there's a good chance that they have set dates prior to these dates that you need to turn in paperwork, dates that you need to have all your registration done, dates you have to have all your volunteer trainings and clearances done. Um, again, these are our dates. 
please check with your district rep on what their dates are so you're not late turning in paperwork. Um, additionally, if you would like to take down this link, should you be a team that advances to the state tournament, we will have a pre-competition webinar like we do before every state tournament, February 6th, 2024 at 6 30 p.m it'll be on zoom it'll be recorded but if you want to register now just in case you go that's great if you don't have to, to advance you just can ignore it at that point last thing is the state tournament is february 13th at hagerstown community college if you've gone before same deal as usual um, we will take 40 teams like we started doing last year uh, that advance from their district tournaments and uh, it will be on the 13th the snow slash rain day is the day after on the 14th, um, but hopefully we will not need that. So I'm gonna go through most of this stuff pretty quick. I'm not gonna cover all this. This essentially takes you through the paperwork that you need to do year after year. None of it is new, they're just reminders. Every student athlete that participates each year needs to fill out an application for participation. This is the one form that we need. So turn it into your district rep when they want it. Um, any athlete or, uh, Unified Partner or Unified Partner IEP 504 that's on your roster needs to turn one of these in. The other thing every student athlete needs to turn in is a CDW or Co Communicable Disease Waiver. It's our COVID form. Um, again, it takes care of everything that may come down the line in the future as well. If they've done one of these in the past, they don't have to do it again. It's a one and done form. With that said, if you're already sending home one form for your student athletes to get filled out, you might as well just send the other one to make sure they have it done because um, it's harder to chase paperwork on the back end of the season. If you are a coach coming over from one of the fall sports and your student athletes have already done this for this year, you don't have to do it again. Just have to do it whenever they first start for the year and they're good for the whole year. This is the team roster. Same thing has not changed. Again, fill out the first page so we know who you are. Second page, again, I will continue to harp on this for teams because it's probably the most important part. The top section here, if you have head coaches, assistant coaches, uh, team managers that are student athletes, volunteers, uh, paraprofessionals, a super active athletic director that comes to competitions with you, anybody that's going to be participating on your, on your team, working with your student athletes, please put it at the top of your roster. That's how we make sure they get to the GMS system. That's how we make sure they get credentialed. We want to make sure that all those things are lined up. So should you go to the state tournament, we have all that stuff ready to go. This is stuff about LSS managers, uh, the people that input the data. Um, this is where the stuff talks about class A clearance. Anybody that is a coach, assistant coach, volunteer, paraprofessional, anybody working with the student athletes on your team needs to be class A cleared by SOMD. Uh, and there's three things that allow them to be class A cleared. One, it's a volunteer application background check. Uh, the second thing is a protective behaviors training. And then it's the COVID form. All of these things can be done by going to Volunteer Hub and registering there or re-upping your trainings there if you've already done them with, you know, three years ago or so. The other option is you can turn in paper versions of this to your district rep and they can send them along and we will do them hard copy wise. It's a lot easier for us if you do it through Volunteer Hub. But again, we understand uh, that not everybody is, you know, uh, technology driven. Sometimes it's easier to print out those forms, go through them and do them. Um, with that said, the protective behaviors training is online no matter what, um, but there is an easier way to access it if you don't want to go through Volunteer Hub. Um, all of that can also be found on our SOMB website under school-based coaches resource. We'll share the link to that as well. Essentially, the rest of these, they're all just walking you through how to do protective behaviors and how to register for Volunteer Hub. Um, you can go through these slides, we'll share them on the website, we'll send them out. Um, but essentially these go step by step by step. Most of your district reps also keep them in the slide decks that they share with you at the beginning of the season so that they can get them to you as well. Here's the link for the coaches resource page for indoor bocce. This will have primarily the bocce resources. Uh, if you go to the initial page for school-based resources on our website off of the main homepage, That'll actually give you links to every sport page that we have. And below that, it'll give you access to download all the documents that I just talked about for being a class A cleared coach, volunteer, paraprofessional, whatever it may be. 
Additionally, uh, this is a good link that you can use for some additional resources from Special Olympics. Um, there's a lot of good coaches training tools, uh, you know, tools to help you work with athletes with intellectual disabilities, um, unified sports logos, so on and so forth. Uh, it's a very good link, has a lot of additional details. At some point, it's probably worth going to and clicking on. Um, so check it out when you get a chance. We're going to hit some Comar regulation stuff really quick. Um, I don't see anything in chat or hands raised. So we're going to keep going along here. Um, Comar regulations. I continue to say this to your district reps, and I will let you know as coaches as well. Um, Special Olympics Maryland doesn't enforce Comar in any sort of way. We work very closely with MPSSAA to make sure Comar rules are being followed. And if something needs to be reported, it gets reported to MPSSAA. Long story short about Comar is if you are playing a sport where there's a varsity sport in the same school, um, you can't do both. Good news is bocce is only a Special Olympics unified sport, so you shouldn't have that issue. We run into that issue with track and field and tennis and flag football. Those are sports that we run into that issue with. Um, bocce is not something that you have to worry about. With that said, if you have questions about Comar stuff or think there's a Comar issue, reach out to your athletic director or your athletic supervisor for your district. Um, they're the best people to talk to. They're the ones who have to oversee it for your district, report to MPSSAA, so on and so forth. Um, so again, check in with the athletic folks in your neck of the woods for Comar stuff. If you do not know what our district layout is, uh, the most recent district we added was Baltimore County. Um, they will be back for indoor bocce with us this year and we're very excited. Um, and for bocce, the majority of the programs that participate are the Western programs, uh, Garrett Allegheny, Washington, Frederick, Montgomery, Prince George's, Charles County, and uh, Baltimore County and Baltimore City. Uh, the Western part of the state does indoor bocce, the eastern and the shore part of the state do strength and conditioning, which is our version of a combo of powerlifting and indoor track and field. Uh, any questions on Comar stuff? Not seeing anything. Okay, we will continue on. Um, again, you can always follow up afterwards with district reps or with us if you have any questions. Um, if there's anything that pops up question-wise, it'll probably more than likely be with the rules reminders that we're gonna go through now. Um, so here's a note on ramp specs. Uh, I have been talking to folks from Special Olympics North America, Special Olympics International for almost a year plus now on if there is going to be some sort of bocce ramp specs, uh, a specialized number between this height and this, with this length and width, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing so far that they have decided. Uh, there's no specs for if somebody's going to a national or international games and needs a ramp. So as of right now, there's no specs for ramps. The only thing that has to happen is following the standard ramp rules. Uh, again, when you're using a ramp, you can either use it from the 10 foot foul line or there, we have the extended 20 foot wheelchair slash ramp uh, foul line. Essentially, it's the, the short court line uh, for state programs that play short court bocce. We don't do that. The only other thing that comes along with that when it comes to the ramp is the front part where the ball leaves the ramp and touches the court floor just has to be behind that 20 foot line. It can be anywhere behind that 20 foot line um, and we don't have an issue with it as long as it's behind that 20 foot line. Uh, additionally, if you have somebody that is an athlete that needs a little bit more of assistance with the ramp from uh, either a unified partner or a paraprofessional or a coach or whomever is the ramp person for that athlete, the biggest thing is they need to be communicating about where they want the ramp placed, when they want the ball placed on the ramp, and when they want to let the ball go. Um, the athlete needs to be involved in the decision making the issue comes in when unified partners or coaches or whoever are lining up the ramp, putting the ball on there and doing 99.9% .9 of the work. So make sure if you have a ramp assistant that somebody is communicating with the athlete, the athlete is giving the orders of where the ramp should go and when they want the ball placed on there and everything should be fine from there. 
again, this is just a visual for you guys. When we talked about where the uh, ramp can be, it can be behind the 10 foot line here, or it can be behind the dotted 20 foot line. We mark all of our courts with that for indoor and outdoor bocce. Um, again, realistically, as long as the edge of the ramp where the ball leaves the ramp and goes onto the court is behind the 20 foot line, we don't care where you set it up prior to there. Uh, another thing that has come up, it has been uh, passed along, I think, as what per people perceive as a rule of bocce for Special Olympics, um, but it's not. It's more of a, you know, unwritten rule that's found its way in there over the years. Um, typically, most teams, whoever delivers the Polina, delivers the first bocce ball. That is not a rule. Somehow it is wiggled into our uh, circles of bocce that people think that is a rule, but that is not the case. Um, the player that delivers the Polina does not have to deliver the first bocce ball and can step back out after the Polina is delivered and another player on the team, the group of four, can deliver the first bocce ball. Totally up to you guys. If your team is used to whoever delivers the Polina delivers the first bocce ball, you can absolutely stick with that. There's nothing wrong with that. We just wanted to let you know that the first person that delivers the Polina does not have to throw the first bocce ball. Um, additional note that I will continue to remind folks on when it comes to delivering bocce balls in general as well, is that bocce balls have to be delivered below the waist. Um, we will make sure our officials are more on top of this year, this year because I saw it a little bit in outdoor, but more or less, I saw it in indoor bocce a lot more. If it's released above the waist, that ball will be removed from play and won't count. Um, so just a reminder, the ball has to be released below the waist. Uh, updates for coaching, more or less, it's reminders and that we are going to make sure we are um, a little bit more intentional about supporting no coaching when no coaching is supposed to happen. Um, the facets of coaching that's allowed when it comes to matches is that uh, the second a player steps into the court with a bocce ball or picks up a bocce ball and steps into the court, nobody's communicating with that player. Um, unless a special case has been approved by the tournament director of this athlete needs somebody else in there with them because of their disability or whatever it may be. Once somebody picks up a Polina or a bocce ball and steps into the court, no one's communicating with them. They have their time to think, breathe, and deliver the bocce ball or Polina. Uh, when a player is not delivering a bocce ball or Polina, they and their teammates may communicate freely uh, before somebody steps in. Um, again, we want them to communicate as quickly as they can so we can keep the match going but they can communicate freely. If somebody on the team, an athlete or a partner, needs to communicate with the coach, they can step back or step out to the side where the coach's box is, and they can communicate with the coach if they did not pick up a bocce ball. Um, if somebody else goes and picks up a bocce ball for that frame, and they're going to roll it for your team, somebody else can step away and talk to the coach, but the coach cannot communicate to the person that has picked up a bocce ball. Um, again, we want coaches to stay in the coach's box. We will have chairs for you there. Uh, we will have chairs for your participants um, inside the coach's box, closer to the court. Um, and if you have a team that transitions from one end to the other, whether that be because you have a team of eight and you have four and four on each side and you travel back and forth as the frames change as a coach, or if you have a rotation that happens because you have more than four but less than eight and you have to go back and forth, coaches can go from one end to the other in the coaches' boxes that will be marked for the tournament. Um, if coaches are violating the coaching rules that we've covered, there will be penalties in a three strikes manner uh, as it's written below. Uh, the first warning, a ball is removed from their team's available balls for that frame. Uh, so if you've rolled... Uh, zero balls and there's a coaching infraction issued by a tournament official or uh, tournament director, you'll throw three balls instead of four. Uh, second warning, coach will come out of the box for the remainder of the match. You, you'll be put in the stands as a coach. 
Uh, third warning, coach is going to be removed from the competition area for the remainder of the event. You have to stay in the stands. There's no going back onto the court. Um, I don't think we'll need to use any of these, but again, just reminders. Here's a picture of what the court looks like with the coach's boxes. Uh, it's a little bit of a scrunched up picture. So the back end of the coach's box on the left and right will be a little further back behind the court, but it will wrap around the back end of the court. So if you need to be on the side to communicate with athletes as they come over or be able to make eye contact with uh, athletes that feel a stronger comfort level being able to see you, that's okay. The communication rules still apply, but you need to be behind where the green line is going to be, which is going to be the coach's box on each side. Some roster lineup requirements and just reminders. Again, uh, Unified Bocce is a minimum of four, maximum of eight players. You can have a roster up to 10. Those two extras become alternates that can be switched in between matches. Um, but again, we want to make sure that you try to do your best to have an even roster so that your rotation can be even. Uh, you know, at a given time per frame, you need to have two players with a disability and two players without or you can have three players with a disability and one without a disability. Uh, that two to two or three to one ratio are the only acceptable ratios per frame. Uh, so you need to comprise your roster of enough students to make that lineup happen frame to frame to frame. Um, if there is an issue with that, if during recruiting you are a little bit lopsided, talk to your district rep. They have some solutions of uh, helping sometimes rearrange teams for it to make sense. Reminders, uh, a team that is five to eight players, uh, you must make any sort of substitution between frames and your rotation that happens between frames. It has to be before the Polina is thrown for the frame. Once the Polina is thrown, whatever four you have set for that frame, they are the ones playing that frame. It doesn't change after that. Uh, that's how we prevent any sort of aces being swapped in after the Polina is thrown. Um, so again, you can rotate your players as you need to. If you have uh, anywhere between five, six, or seven players, we get you're going to have to have a rotation. Once the Polina is thrown, though, whatever four you set out there when the Polina is thrown is the four that stay out there for that frame. Uh, additionally, like I mentioned earlier, if you have eight players, uh, essentially you need to have four on one end, four on the other that meet the ratios that we talked about in the last slide. Additionally, we talked about alternates. If you have a ninth or 10th player on your team, again, you can have up to 10 on a roster. You can substitute them between full matches. They do, you can't sub them in between frames. Um, and once the first Polina of a match is thrown, you're not subbing anyone in unless there's an injury or something approved by the competition director. Reminders for really helping us out. Uh, we know we have a lot of bocce participation throughout the districts, which is awesome. We know that you guys have to make multiple teams a lot of the times, which is also awesome. Please, please, please do your team name and a number for your teams. Um, as fun as it may be to be, uh, you know, the Annapolis High School Sharks and the Annapolis High School dolphins in the Annapolis high school blowfish. I don't know. Aquatic theme tonight. I don't, I don't know what I'm thinking, of, but um, as fun as that is, it's really hard for us to keep track. If you can just label your teams when it comes to your competition rosters, Annapolis high school team one, Annapolis high school team two. If you want to have a secret name on the side, you're more than welcome to, but the number teams help us keep things straight. Additionally, reminders on uniforms. Uh, we've been a little bit tougher on uniforms we want to make sure that everyone's showing up in the correct uniform. Otherwise, they're not going to be allowed to play. The most important thing for the uniform off the top is the top, which has some sort of combination of your team name, uh, your school name, your team mascot, whatever it is. And it's got to have that unified sports logo in the three places that are shown on the screen. It be on the chest, on the sleeve, on the back of the neck. Those are all fine. Um, when it comes to tops, they can be jerseys, they can be polos, they can be um, uh, t-shirts that are, are logoed. We're not specific about you have to have this design of shirt, but it has to have your team name, high school name, mascot name, whatever it is, and the unified sports logo. When it comes to the pants, 
It needs to be something uniform across your team. If you want to tell all your student athletes for bocce to wear khakis, that's fine. They can wear khakis. If you want to tell them all to wear sweatpants or joggers, that's fine. Try to get them all at least just wearing the same colored sweatpants or joggers. If you want to tell them to all wear athletic shorts, that's fine. Just try to keep them all wearing the same thing. They don't have to be the same exact brand or the same exact shorts. Um, but if you just tell people to have black shorts that are, you can go out to Walmart and grab black shorts for $6 a pop. Um, so again, just make sure you're communicating to your team that they have the right uniform. Uh, additionally, even though bocce is a little bit more of a relaxed sport, we don't want people showing up in like slides and Crocs and, and sandals. We still want them wearing athletic shoes. Just like if you go out to any other basketball court for anything else, the basketball court can be slick with certain shoes on it. We want you to have shoes that have traction so you're not slipping on the court. Um, so please make sure your student athletes are following the uniform specifications. If they're not, when they get to competition, they won't be allowed to play and they'll be removed from play and it'll just hurt your team overall. If you need uniforms or equipment stuff, step one is always talk to your athletics director or your supervisor of athletics or the district rep. Work things out within your district. If there's an issue with funding at the school level, then have your district rep reach out to me. We will see what we can do. Um, we might be able to help you out. We might be able to assist. I can't promise anything, but we will always do our best to support you guys and find what we can do to support uh, your student athletes. All right, that's the rules update in the section. Um, again, slideshow was relatively long but I wanted to open it up to questions at the end as well. I don't see questions in chat. Don't see hand raised. I'm totally cool with keeping this short. Everyone knows that I don't meet for meeting. Um, if you guys have been in any webinars with me, we want to get through. We want to get you the information that you need and we want to get out. Uh, we know you guys have had long days at school in the first place. So we appreciate you guys joining us for the webinar. We appreciate those that uh, go and watch a recorded webinar. So thank you guys for everything that you've done. Uh, thank you for all of you that have done stuff through the fall season and we're really excited for a winter season. Again, if there's any questions or concerns you have, reach out to your district rep, reach out to myself, Tyler, Katie, um, whoever, and we will get you an answer. If one person can't, they will get it from somewhere else. So. Thank you guys again for joining us. And if you have anything throughout the rest of the season, follow up. And we're excited to see you guys throughout the season on the court and enjoy the holiday seasons as we go along as well.